Welcome, 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 friends, to the On The Way Home podcast. I am your host, Michael Braithwaite. Uh, I work with the good folks at Blue Door uh, Organization with a long history of supporting our most vulnerable in the areas of York, Peel, and Durham. We do housing, health, and meaningful employment, and so much more. Check us out at bluedor.ca. Listen, we have an awesome podcast for you today. I know I always say that. I always say that. But it is an awesome podcast today. It's, it's a panel. I always love having panels because we just get like, just the, the brilliance that comes with them. Uh, today, we wanted to talk about seniors housing and seniors uh, aging population and the services for seniors. And so we brought in three of our country's top experts. We have Tom Hunter uh, from Toronto Seniors Housing join us. We have Christina Binsans from Chats, uh, serving 11 municipalities across uh, the Northern GTA uh, in, in York and Simcoe. And we have uh, Jennifer uh, Breakspear, who's the Associate Vice President, Service Delivery and Regional Operations with BC Housing. Uh, we talk about what's happening coast to coast. We talk about the challenges that seniors are facing right now. Uh, we talk about some of the cool things all three of them are doing to rise to those challenges. Uh, we, we take a look across the around the world, across Canada, at some innovations that are happening that we'd love to bring uh, into Canada. And we talk about the hopes for the future. Uh, it's, a, it's a long podcast. It's a wonderful podcast. It's full of Easter eggs and gems. Uh, listen, you know, it's, we see at Blue Door, my organization, um, that one of the fastest growing populations experiencing homelessness are seniors. Um, and, you know, everyone deserves that dignity in life to either age in place or a safe place to call home uh, and not to be isolated. And we're seeing that time and time again. Things have to change, but there's good people with solutions. And three of them are here on this podcast. Take a listen. I think you'll enjoy it as much as I do. What an amazing panel that we have for you today. Incredible group of experts in their field and beyond. Thank you so much for taking the time out today to join us on the way home. Thank you. Good to be here. Thank you. Thank you. We have a bunch of questions to get to, and we really want to talk about uh, the topic. However, before we do that, we have a standard question we ask all of, uh, all of our guests on the show, and that is, what does home mean to you? Christina, we're going to start with you, then we'll go to Tom and finish with Jennifer. Thanks very much, uh, Michael. I, I think, you know, the first thing that comes to mind is, is home is where the heart is. And, um, you know, home can be a physical place, but I think that for many people, home is much broader. It's, it's about your, where your community is, where your family is, where the things that you know and are comfortable with uh, are located. And um, so I think really to me that that sort of summarizes the importance of, of home being a place where there's social engagement, um, spiritual engagement, and uh, you have that, that comfort of knowing that it's, it's your place. Great. I guess from, from my perspective, I think of when, when I walk in uh, through my door at uh, my home, and, and it's a feeling for me as I, as I come through. It is, it is, there's this, this a calm, it's a comforting place for me. It's about familiarity. It's a, it's also a feeling of, of security and, and knowing that people, you know, who I care about are there, who I can make connections with. And also just beyond that, it's, a, it's about then, it, it, in the community around me, those relationships that I have, who those people live next to me, and, and how I, you know how I, I live with them and, and share and, and engage with them. So, yeah, it, that's uh, that's good for the broader kind of community uh, perspective. And I would I would say it's 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 a combination of what Tom and Christina have both said. You know, on a high level, home is uh, safe, secure, uh, sustainable housing with the people I care about, the supports I need you know, nearby, uh, but more deeper personally, uh, my wife, Lori and I have, have traveled and lived in different parts of this country. And, and I would say home is, is where Lori and I are able to both be uh, comfortable and safe. And, and, you know, she uses the term of we're in the basket, we're in the basket of family, friends, yeah. community, and, and that's, that's home regardless of where it physically is. All, all great answers, and, and I, I heard themes of uh, safety, security, family, community is big. And here's what we learned as well, uh, sometimes the hard way in that um, I know with my organization, Blue Door, 
and others we've been with, it's, it's not just about the actual physical structure, right? So sometimes what we'll have is individuals will come into emergency housing, 24-7 uh, emergency housing, and then they're there for a month or two, and we put them in housing, and they end up back with us a couple months later because what we did did not do is we didn't build community. They got a home, but when they were at the shelter, they built a community with their 29 buddies and staff that cared and asked how they were doing, and they had food, and then we put them in a home where none of that happened, and it wasn't about the four walls. It was about the community they built. So we've gotten better at building communities around people, and that's absolutely what it comes to housing. It's not just about that structure, and very rarely does anyone say, four walls and a roof uh, when asked that question. I think Jesse Thistle's answer is still my favorite. Uh, and he said, home is love. And I thought that was pretty mm -hmm. succinct and, and very true. Um, I want to learn all about all of you and your organizations. You uh, bring a lot of experience uh, to this work. This time, uh, we're going to start with Jennifer, then go to Christina and end with Tom. But Jennifer, tell us a little bit about your journey and about your organization. Yeah, sure. Thanks for the opportunity, Michael. Um, um, my journey, uh, uh, not to do a whole career spread, but uh, I had been for quite a while an executive director of some uh, social service agencies uh, in Vancouver that uh, were either a, a local focus or a provincial focus. Uh, and, and that leadership journey took me to uh, being the executive director of, of PHS, which some people know as uh, Portland Hotel Society in Vancouver's downtown east side. I was there for a while uh, and then uh, went on to uh, lead an organization in the Fraser Valley uh, east of Vancouver, which uh, supports women and children fleeing violence. I was there for uh, another few years, and uh, that led me to uh, my current role, which is Associate Vice President at BC Housing. Uh, BC Housing is a provincial crown corporation, uh, and our mission is to provide access to safe, quality, accessible, and affordable housing options with a vision uh, that everyone has a place to call home. Um, BC Housing, if, if, if you'll indulge me for a moment, is, 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 a, is a very comprehensive Crown Corporation in that we uh, develop, manage, and administer a wide range of subsidized housing options across the province. But we also license residential builders, administer owner and builder authorizations, carry out research and education that benefit the residential construction agency, consumers, and the housing sector. Um, much of my work personally is around supporting the delivery of, of our programs and our regional operations across the province. So in fact, I'm speaking to you today from uh, Prince George in Northern BC uh, on the territory of the uh, Klawakane people in, in here in the North. Christina, we'll go to you next. A little bit about your journey into the work in your organization, please. Yeah, I, not unlike Jennifer, I spent um, the earlier part of my career working in um, trade associations in senior capacities, including as CEO or executive director, um, and mostly in the healthcare space, uh, pharmacy, pharmaceuticals. Um, and a friend of mine was the chair of CHATS, Community and Home Assistance to Seniors, and approached me. She was the chair of the organization, but they were looking for new board members. And she felt that uh, with my experience in, in advocacy, more from a business uh, standpoint, that I would bring some value to the board. So uh, I applied and, and was recruited and served three years on the board. The organization then went through some, some challenges that um, uh, led to a number of, of people in the organization leaving, and uh, that included the, the uh, CEO at the time. So my colleagues, fellow colleagues on the board asked me if I would step in on an interim basis to just kind of keep the lights on until they could uh, recruit for another CEO at CHATS. That was uh, 12 years ago. At the time I said, okay, I'll do it for six to nine months, but I had other, other plans of, of uh, where I wanted to go. And uh, as I said, 12 years later, I'm, I'm still here. So it's, it's a phenomenal organization and I have been truly blessed um, in the time that I've been there to see how the team works in such a committed way to really ensure that our our mandate and, and vision which is 
is to enable older adults and their family caregivers to uh, stay in their own communities as long as possible in their own homes, to be fully engaged uh, socially in their communities uh, through receiving the kinds of supports that they, they need to uh, help them to do that. So keeping them out of long-term care uh, where possible and uh, certainly uh, avoiding hospital admissions and hospital stays. Um, the organization has, has grown so much because our population that we serve has changed a lot. It's a much more diverse uh, community of older adults. Uh, we're a regional organization, so we serve in 11 municipalities in uh, the area north of, of Toronto. Um, and the population has changed. Of course, we all know that uh, in Canada, uh, that the aging population is increasing very dramatically or the seniors population. So we're, we're constantly faced with changing needs um, changing dynamics in terms of who we serve and, and how we need to serve them in a more equitable, um, diverse and inclusive way to ensure that they have a sense of belonging in their communities and through what we do. And with that comes, you know, a lot of need for innovation, excitement, working with other partners. Uh, Michael, our organizations, Blue Door and Chats, have worked together um, on a number of initiatives. And who would have thought that you'd have, you know, a senior serving organization with, with an organization dealing with the, the uh, unhoused uh, issues working so collaboratively together. So that's kind of my, my journey and um, uh, the story of, of chats and how we've evolved and continue to, to look for ways in which we could better meet the needs of, of the uh, people that we serve. Thanks for that, Christina. And your chats is doing incredible work. I can absolutely vouch for that. And you also wear another hat too, which I admire and think is, is I don't know how you do it, but I don't know if you're free to just talk about the other hat that you wear that gives you a different perspective as well. Uh, absolutely. I'm uh, now in my third term as a municipal councillor in the town of Newmarket. So I'm a, a ward councillor. I have a particular geography that, that I represent uh, in the town, but also you know, working on behalf of all residents in, in the town of Newmarket. And, and uh, that's another, not just role, but organization that I'm particularly proud of. I think that Newmarket has done a lot of very innovative things. Um, we've taken a, taken a lead uh, in the region that we're located in, in terms of uh, looking at, at more affordable housing or housing that is, is um, uh, more appropriate for a range of, of needs. So uh, very proud of that. We have a, a strong mayor who is um, very committed to, to housing for all and um, a very dedicated council in that direction as well. A wonderful council uh, and mayor, and, and you guys are doing so much, and we're, we're grateful for that. Uh, Tom, if you could round us out, talk about your journey and even your organization, because it's fairly new. It's a yes, fairly yeah. new split, and there's a reason for that. That's right. Yeah, so this is this is my professional elevator pitch. Uh, so I, I spent most of my career in, in long-term care with seniors uh, as the administrator of long-term care homes, but also in the, the community. And with a, a focus for me was around uh, areas of dementia and um, you know mental health, and then also spent some time in areas such as the regional geriatric program earlier in, in my career. So that kind of community and long-term care focus with, with seniors. And then probably about 10 years ago, uh, I was asked to, to take leadership of the, the city housing Hamilton. And uh, so that was a, a shift, but it was just an incredible uh, opportunity for me at, at city housing Hamilton, where, you know, it was able to use some of that kind of experience around, around health and, and care and, and then supports and, and in, in Hamilton, uh, City Housing Hamilton, looking at the um, 
of the run the integration of better care and supports in several more high risk buildings. And also in, in this area, we started to, uh, we, we did a lot of work in uh, the development of, of new buildings, revitalization of, a, of an apartment building and, and two community revitalization programs where, where, for, where for us, there was a high focus on, on uh, high performance buildings. And which was really what I, I saw the benefit there was, was how that type of build really supported uh, individuals, uh, you know, in a, a better, higher quality living environment, but then it also helped to make some of those kind of sustainability goals that we have for our community. So for me, it was a real, uh, so that was an opportunity from both the, the delivery of uh, supports to to the the, uh, the tenants and also around the actual physical build. And then when when Toronto, this opportunity at Toronto Seniors came up, what a, what a perfect kind of uh, integration for me with seniors and, and housing to bring to bring those, those two together and, and look at then how do we kind of optimize that support uh, for for senior tenants to to age at home and that that is and that like takes me into the work of Toronto seniors housing corporation which is just just two years old we celebrated two years at the beginning of June and it had to, essentially Toronto community housing the decision was made out of the tenants first plan years ago by council to take uh, 83 seniors buildings low to moderate income uh, seniors and that was roughly 15,000 units and we often describe it as a lift and a shift uh, to to the new corporation of Toronto seniors and so that that was the kind of the genesis of, of our organization with a real focus our mandate is around uh, supports for for senior uh, for the tenants senior tenants in our building age in their home forging partnerships to better provide those wellness supports health supports and then also real a real focus on the education for our staff so that they can best work in this space. Incredible work. And Tom, I know you just also finished a stint where you, you yeah. stood in uh, as both, right, for or trying to I do did. housing. Yes, I, I, I stepped in for eight months for the interim uh, president CEO at Toronto Community Housing Corporation. And so it was a great opportunity for me, you know, because they provide a lot of the back office support to us. The buildings are still owned by Toronto Community Housing. And so it was just a real opportunity for me to see what kind of what are those opportunities uh, across op both organizations. And I do need to say that there are still there are 17,000 seniors who live at Toronto Community Housing. So there's there's also this opportunity moving into the future how do we work with um but those, those seniors uh in toronto community housing and, and, and support them as well amazing well it's like all of you are doing incredible work uh, and jennifer you know we're always so fortunate to have our friends from bc housing on that you're doing uh national leading work out on the west coast and uh and we've seen just recently we borrow things it, the bc was the first to do the rental protection fund and now that's a national piece uh and it was it was easier to do nationally because we could say hey there's a model right away we could get up and running so thank you for all you do out there today if people haven't figured out uh, we want to talk about uh, vulnerable seniors and and of course seniors in housing and the different pieces uh, we want to see what we're seeing uh, that's happening out there. Where does some of the trends and of course, what are the things we're doing? What are the challenges? What are the solutions? And we're going to talk all about that today. Um, we want to start with the challenges and Tom, I'm going to start with you. Yeah. What are some of the challenges you're seeing? You mentioned 17,000 you house. I, I guessing that there's a lot more uh, in need uh, and that'd be one of the challenges, but what are some of the other things you're seeing? Yes. Yeah, well, actually it just, uh, Michael, it's 15,000 seniors in Toronto seniors. It was seventeen thousand at Toronto community housing. So large, large numbers, right? Both large numbers. But uh, for us, I'm going to um, I'm going to pick up. Uh, Christina had talked about diversity, and so I, I it, it is a challenge for our, our vulnerable seniors around diversity. But also too, there's a lot of opportunity. I think we're going to have a chance to talk about that opportunity later in the podcast. But what we just recently did a a, a tenant engagement survey, where you know fifty percent of our seniors. Um, uh, have one or more disability. 80% um, were born outside of Canada and uh, almost 40% prefer speaking um, a language other than English. And uh, we know that across our buildings, we have 60 different languages. And so when, when we talk about, uh, you know, for our, our vulnerable seniors, for us, and, and when, when I go to the different buildings, I, I just hear a lot about, um, 
you know, be, because of the, the, some of the challenges that they might have around co communication and how do they, you know, when they want to get the, the different supports and, and connect, that becomes a real, I think, an issue for seniors. And at, at their age, you know, that the use of technology, right, that, that creates a vulnerability for them as well. And certainly we know with um, around the financial right uh, uh, issues for, for our seniors. And I know here in Toronto, when you look at the, the you know, the cost of housing we have in Vancouver as well, right? Um, but, you know, in our affordable uh, market units where that gap between somebody's income and the, the, you know, the rent just seems to get, you know, wider for them, I have tenants saying to me, you know, I'm using my, my savings, right, to help so that I can stay in this unit. And so there there is that that vulnerability uh, for sure that, that exists. And then the other thing that I'm seeing, you know, in the time that I've been in Toronto, let's say, versus a community such as, as Hamilton or even Niagara, right, with a lot of long-term care, is because of the size of, of, of the... Uh, the, the city and the different organizations that are involved, I find that it, around our space in partnerships, it's it's really a challenge for us to bring uh, to, to know who those partners are. How do we best work with them? And then I, I think if I can, if I think that for as an organization, it's difficult for us. That vulnerability for our seniors is amplified, right, with all those aspects of aging around how they get those supports that they need. Thanks for that, Tom. Jennifer, what are you seeing? Uh, some of the challenges on the West Coast around seniors and seniors housing. Yeah, and, and it really starts with a challenge almost for, for everybody around uh, lack of affordability. And and then it doubles down for, for seniors. Of course, folks on fixed income don't have the, the opportunity to, to stretch uh, when, when the affordability crunch comes along. So you know, everybody on this call knows about how that's impacting folks. You know, people are making some really tough choices about uh, about their homes. Um, we've we've seen the number of seniors experiencing homelessness has, has increased significantly over the last few years. And, you know, that's obviously a huge concern uh, for folks being unhoused, but also with folks with the increased needs that we're seeing among many of the vulnerable seniors who are showing up in, in shelters and, and uh, other spaces, uh, having uh, physical and, 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 and mental health uh, crises that need attention, and, and that's hard to, to get in a, in a shelter setting. Um, shelters don't accommodate well to to vulnerable seniors and and that that's huge and, and i know that uh, michael your your organization has been facing some of those challenges as well um you know the we you don't need me to tell you about the where the the risks for homelessness it can be attributed of course we're all seeing the rising cost of living the the, the the rising costs of housing the limited supply of, of appropriate housing and then the the fixed incomes that are just insufficient um but beyond that, you know, we know that our seniors are facing uh, increased social isolation, food insecurity, mobility challenges, and and all of that is just becoming, gosh, beyond a double and triple threat to, to almost uh, paralyzing. In and uh, you know, as as one who is looking down down the road at, at retirement, you know, we're all trying to look after ourselves while also trying to figure out how to ensure there are the services for folks more vulnerable. And uh, so certainly at BC Housing, we've been giving a lot of thought. You know, we've got our the independent living that we help uh, develop, build, uh, operate. We have a lot of great nonprofits throughout the province who are operating independent living for seniors. Um, the challenge being to get more services into those buildings, to be able to better support seniors, to stay in those buildings longer. Um, so uh, maybe a little, you know, a little bit further in a conversation, I can tell you a bit about some of the stuff we're doing to support that, helping folks stay where they, where they've reached, they've got a good place to live. How do we ensure they can stay there as long as possible? Yeah, amazing. It's interesting when uh, talking to um, groups that uh, apartment complexes where people, it's almost like they're accidentally, they've never left. So it becomes a senior's residence. And, and Christina, you'll know, uh, ch um, yeah. What is it, Micah, in, in our area? So, an interfaith group that does some of these buildings. We're like, oh, it's a seniors' complex. We're like, no, but yes, 
because it, it's happened. They just stayed so long, they're aging in place, and now we need to adapt to actually support them. So so there's there's a lot going on. I'd be interested too, and I want to get to Christina and talk about what, what she's seeing across 11 municipalities, um, but also just even the definition of senior. I mean, where was that like? So at Blue Door, because a little bit of, if someone spent time on the streets, when they come to experience homelessness, we're saying 50 plus is a senior because uh, someone who spent quite a bit of time on the street does not present at 50, uh, presenting a lot older. But but we could get to that later. Christina, 11 municipalities, you're doing a ton of work. What are you seeing? What are some of the challenges? Well, not unlike what uh, Tom and Jennifer shared, uh, I think the the issue around um, having access to to supports is very, very important and very crucial. Um, we provide transportation uh, to medical appointments, social activities, uh, grocery shopping. And, you know, it's beyond just the, the independence that that affords somebody. It's also, you know, the ability to, to get out and um, be able to um, to have that social activity and engagement that's that's also so crucial. Uh, food security, we, we talked about. Uh, but I think the other thing that we're really seeing is that, that, you know, with the housing crisis for all, it's not just seniors that are affected, but, you know, there's a real challenge in not only having housing that's that's more affordable, but it's also about housing that is accessible and enables that that aging in place. Um, you know, we we're seeing in, you know, I think across the GTA and and uh, other areas, this this uh, growing rush to build three story townhomes, very narrow townhomes that have a lot of stairs. Well, if somebody is looking to downsize because they've, you know, out out uh, grown their need for a uh, four bedroom house, you know, as the, the kids have left home and so forth, they're looking for something smaller that they can stay in their own community. Um, those those kinds of built forms aren't being built. There uh, isn't any sort of thought about building a house that, that can be adaptable as somebody does age or, you know, has physical challenges or, or difficulties. It's not just for seniors. But we're not seeing that that happening. It's it's almost as if there's this uh, belief that there's no market for it, and uh, and you know I I would argue differently. But I think that you know that's another area or way that we could look to to support people to stay in their own communities where where they have built connections, where they do know that there are supports available for them. But I'd also like to just um, talk a little bit about some of the ways in which there are models being implemented to help seniors who are living in these these uh, buildings or even communities that are almost accidentally becoming senior communities. And um, we're hearing a lot more about NORCs, naturally occurring retirement communities. And there's a number of different models that are being implemented by municipal housing organizations um, that are designed to bring services into these buildings to support uh, people living there, the seniors and, and potentially other people as well living in those buildings. So it could be everything from bringing in a nurse to do blood pressure monitoring, a pharmacist to do flu vaccines, uh, or just bringing in an organization like CHATS to do some social programming in those buildings. So that's one of the things that we're looking at now, CHATS, is how we can explore different models that exist and bring some of these models into the NORC buildings or NORC communities within the 11 municipalities that, that we're serving. And I'm sure Tom is, is quite familiar as well um, with the NORC in Innovation Center out of uh, Toronto. And uh, so we're, we're very much looking at the learnings from that and how we could bring that into York Region and South Simcoe, which are the, the two uh, regional municipalities that we serve incredible i actually hadn't heard that term before so that's uh -huh. that's uh amazing uh nork and, and it's you know christina i remember um years ago when i was with another organization 360 kids and i think it continued uh we uh we looked at a program that was kind of multiple wins right where it was to create employment opportunities for youth at culinary pieces 
but to take it to another level, um, because the feds had defined youth and seniors as both areas of focus around funding. This was back in 2015 uh, when they first came in and said, here's kind of our focus is going to be there. And we said, what if we had um, these youth learn how to do all this, but then what they would do is they would actually put together meals they would bring to those homes, to just apartment buildings with seniors, get them out of isolation, pro provide really good low-cost meals, and you'd have youth and seniors mingling for that hour. And so we were solving multiple things. And I, I think you and uh, Clovis Grant, the excellent uh, CEO there now, yeah. went ahead with uh, Every Bite Matters. I think it was it was called the program. Yeah, yeah. and we're, we are still running that program uh, in a couple of our adult day programs. So the uh, youth come in and they've prepared all the meals and they serve them. And so they're also spending some time talking and, and chatting with with the clients with the seniors and the seniors love it the days that that they come in they love it because it's not just about somebody serving you a meal but it's that again that social engagement that is so important to address you know the loneliness and and uh making making the seniors feel that they still have a connection you know incredible i i when we were uh years ago we were building a the sorry the region was building a youth hub and attached to it was uh 12 floors of mostly seniors housing and so you had this youth hub in the back and, and the community was how's that going to work and, and we said you know seniors and youth are a pretty good mix I, I think they're they're not threatened and seniors kind of welcome the interaction and it has been a pretty good mix at that that hub um and i think sometimes that the stereotypes that, that people have of course are just that uh stereotypes you are all doing amazing stuff you talked about the challenges let's talk about how you're kind of rising some of the cool things you're doing to rise to those challenges uh this time because we haven't done it yet christina we're going to start with you go to jennifer and then end with tom thanks very much well we're we're particularly proud of a new initiative that um, we're working in partnership with uh, an organization that actually owns and operates long-term care and retirement homes uh, who approached us through one of their sort of not-for-profit uh, arms to uh, raise some funds to purchase property in a building to establish an overnight residential respite care home for persons with dementia. And uh, so we've, we jumped at this opportunity because it'll be the first of its kind that a, a not-for-profit uh, residential care home um, will be established. So we have uh, purchased the property and the building. It's being renovated in an old heritage home. And um, once it's all complete, then it'll be turned over to chats and we'll actually run the operations um, going forward. So it was a really unique partnership. And one may ask, why would a company that owns and operates long-term care and retirement homes not do it themselves? But they felt that that really wasn't their, their lane. And they wanted to work with an organization that had the expertise in, in working directly with, with that uh, respite care feature. And so that's well underway. We're hoping to open uh, early January with, with the home. And in addition to providing that overnight care for, and it's short term, it'll be anywhere from one, one to 14 nights. Um, but in addition to providing that care for, for the clients, for the seniors, it's going to be a very important uh, support for caregivers. So we haven't really talked about family caregivers and uh, the important role they play, but also how, you know, how tenuous the situation can be with family caregivers who become just overwhelmed and, and feeling burdened with having to care for, for people who have, you know, chronic diseases, dementias, uh, and so forth as, as uh, perhaps their parents or their spouses or loved ones are aging. So we're really excited about that. Uh, the other thing is we're, we're also launching or have launched our own podcast called um, Chat About Care in Your Community. And uh, so we're very excited about that and getting more information out to the community about the services that are available. Because often we find, and, and I don't know if uh, Tom and Jennifer have experienced this as well, but we often find that we'll have caregivers come to us and they say, I wish I'd known about chats when mom or dad were alive. 
because you know it would have helped them and helped their their family members so we're trying to get the word out about the the services and supports that are currently available help people to navigate through those and um, also to make sure that that we're keeping the conversation alive about how important it is to invest in community supports uh, from a government standpoint um, from funding and and a policy standpoint very very cool and congratulations on that podcast i think it's a great way to uh get the word out jennifer what's happening on, on on the west coast you're doing always doing incredible stuff what are you excited about yeah thanks for that um we we often are involved in i think pretty interesting stuff i mean there's uh as i said the independent living for seniors that we uh that we support uh, across the province but uh, recently we, uh, and, and this is a credit to our folks in our research department, they uh, 2022 started funding uh, a pilot project for aging in place services that were being conducted by uh, an organization called Hallway House. And uh, this was not so much about the, the, the housing provider as about taking the services, uh, you know, as we mentioned earlier, uh, to the seniors so that they can stay in their homes longer. So the uh, Hallway House project takes, uh, provides uh, non-medical supports such as transportation services, house cleaning, um, some seniors community and social events, um, tenant council and support uh, when folks need that, healthy and nutritious food programs, hospital visits, and, and a myriad of other services. And uh, Simon Fraser University or SFU did a study on this in uh, 2022 to study this this pilot project with Holy House and it, it demonstrated really positive results. You know, we, we had been and we continue to hear anecdotally uh, what a difference it's made to both the seniors and, and the housing providers. The seniors themselves had reported to researchers that uh, the cleaning services that were provided really improved their quality of life. Uh, the other services uh, and engagement uh, brought a sense of community and caring that was uh, generally uh, uh, felt throughout the participants. And providing the regular meals and the opportunities to socialize were really critical non-medical supports that helped them age with dignity within their own homes so without having to take mm -hmm. that what could also be often be a really drastic step of, of moving uh, later in life. Uh, and then we're excited also about another uh, pilot project that we're funding with a, a, a community group in, in Vancouver called uh, Gaia Community Care and Wellness Society. And they're doing some of similar services to Holway House, um, but they're doing it with uh, culturally and linguistically appropriate uh, services for Chinese seniors. These are largely um, Chinese seniors who are living in, in SROs in our single room occupancy buildings in our downtown east side in Vancouver. Uh, and and once mobility challenges come in, those folks have been increasingly isolated. So um, this project was looking at what uh, Gaia is doing in bringing folks who are really attuned to the needs of the of the Chinese seniors, uh, being able to speak their language, being able to, to respond to them culturally appropriately, uh, bringing them out of their rooms, because in those, those SROs, they really are living contained in one room, bringing them out of the room to engage with, with other seniors. Um, I've, I've seen you know, some great things happening around um, fitness classes, whether it's chair yoga or, or you know, tossing a ball across the room to each other, uh, staying seated in their chairs, all sorts of things. and, and uh, uh, the energy that I've seen, Gaia brings, you know, younger Chinese folks who are able to, like I said, connect uh, culturally and linguistically, but bringing uh, these supports and, and seeing incredible uh, gains. Uh, and I would say this is happening with Holy House and with Gaia. Uh, folks who might have previously really been almost shut in and, and you see them blossom you see them connecting again. So uh, huge physical health gains and, and emotional health gains. Mm -hmm. and, and comes back to when you first asked us about home and we all talked about community and being with people, you know, who understand us, who know what we need when we need, when we're in need. And, and if we can be doing more of that sort of thing, you know, there's 
uh, lots that you know we can be doing around structure, around building buildings, and 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 that sort of thing. And that's all very important, but it's it's often that that incredible human connection uh, that that's making such a huge difference that we're really excited about. Tom, we'll, we'll go to you. Okay, great. And, and I might I might kind of take this down to a bit more kind of granular granular level at you know, what's happening within within Toronto Toronto seniors. And I first want to want to talk about you know I mentioned this aspect of, of diversity earlier, and you know eighty three buildings, and we learned very quickly that we just can't throw a net all over those eighty three and say like this is what you know the senior the senior tenants need. And so we very early, you know, set out on, on work around a, a tenant engagement system, I probably is the, the formal framework, but it really, it, for us, it became, it became known as Community Connect Plus. And it is, for us, it is fundamental that we hear from the tenants in our buildings about what is it that they need, right? What, what might they expect? And from there, then that starts to drive how we can build out particular programming that they want to to bring and and for some of them some of the buildings certainly it's around they, they require more supports around uh, the health supports and wellness supports so for us it was really that that tent that the voice of the tenant was key and then also to to the credit of, 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 of the city of toronto when the corporation was formed prior to that as toronto community housing but then it built out the integrated service model where um, in, in our buildings we have senior service coordinators and these individuals help to connect that this the uh, the seniors are kind of individually working with them for for you know, helping to get them to that appointment that they might need so it's the assistance with the individual and then we have um a community service coordinators not as many but they they help with the uh the uh the, the recurring programming that, that uh, we want to see in the building, those partnerships, those larger group activities. So those are some kind of uh, the specific examples that were taken. Uh, and since the forming of the corporation, and we've seen some of the, these needs and, and working with our, uh, with, with our tenants, we, we've implemented a complex tenancy team. Right, so for those for those tenancies that are particularly challenging, right, and, and we're seeing that with the um, with with, with the, uh, the the tenants coming into our buildings, they they need more support and in some cases very focused. So the city has a rapid rehousing initiative. We we set up our complex uh, tenancy team. They work they work well together. But it's a, a way for us when we talk about these challenges of the the the. Um, that, that our tenants face that, that many of us have mentioned the, this team takes a more focused look on, on, on that support there so those are those are ways in, in which you know we we have really helped to uh, address some of these these challenges it's a start it's a start for us but lots to do that's wonderful tom and i love the whole nothing for us without us involving that's right. the voice right it's not what we think it's what we know because we listened uh, and that's amazing to do especially when you're serving the uh, amount of individuals you are tom i'm going to stay with you when you're looking across the landscape what's what has to change what has to give so we give seniors the uh, the supports they need yeah and so, and I, and Michael, I'm going to take it back to what do the tenants tell us? And so, we recently did a, a tenant uh, a tenant survey, and we had out of our 15,000 tenants, we had a 24 percent response rate, uh, and and so we had a really great representative sample. And also interesting that 90, 97 percent of them did it in writing, like. No, no, it's not no, no computer based, right? That's something else we have to be attentive to is, is how we connect, right? And what, what, what the group is capable of. But what they told us is um, program offerings, right? So they, although we have 200 kind of recurring in the buildings, that is still what, what they want in, in many of the buildings. They want more, more, of, more of that programming there. They also, they also, another key area that they had identified was access to service, right? So it is a, you know, we know the number of tenants who don't, have, you know, who may not have a family physician, right? So how do, how do they get connected to, to those services? So that's another area uh, that they raised with us. And then also for, for us, you know, being open, they, it was about the relationship around how, when, when they have a concern, how do they, how, how do they best share that with us and then and then how do, how do they get a, a response so from from that's what we heard from from our tenants around uh you know what what we can do to better meet their needs but we also i think it's also around um 
where, where we're also noticing like a significant gap for us in, in, in the space that we're working is this, how are we connecting? What are the, how do we form our partnerships with all these various providers? And if I can just give an example, um, I, I had a, a board member when I was at Toronto Community Housing suggesting to me, you know, you should work with house calls which is an organization in Toronto, very specific to certain area codes. So, you know, contacted House Call, arranged a meeting, make a long story short, they offer, um, they, they, they have a thousand clients on their caseload, 500 were at Toronto, uh, Toronto Seniors Housing, we didn't even know about it. And, and so for me, there's this whole element of, um, you know, we, we, need to, we need to know better who's in our buildings and how we, how we better support them. And then how do we, you know, how do we rally you know the the, uh, the uh, it, groups of the health service or the shelter system, so that we are you know we, we are I, I keep talking about a system, but we really don't have a system. To, it's just it just seems to be you know just a lot of organizations trying to trying to work together. But for me, that that is that is critical that there has to be better connectivity and, and understanding uh, uh, across all of the different delivers of uh, services and supports for seniors. Uh, you want uh, you want the big tent approach, not the siloed approach. And it sounds like often we're doing a lot of the right things. We're just all kind of doing them in yep. our own silos and bringing that together. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. For sure. Uh, Jennifer, what do you think? What do you see looking at the landscape? You know, if you thought, well, if we just did X, Y, Z, this would make such a difference. What are those things for you? <laughs> well, you know, we're we're a, a housing developer and a housing provider here at BC Housing, as well as providing services, and and we're a we're an agency of the Crown. You know, we're, we're a provincial uh, agency, and so with that, it's it's what is will of government, and we're approaching a, a provincial election here in BC in the fall. So really, it's it's going to come down to what was the will of the voters. You know, what if what are folks making as as their priority? for the people when they're when they're casting their ballots and uh i would hope that uh you know folks who are paying attention to your podcast michael in, in british columbia are going to be calling on uh candidates in the fall election with their concerns about housing for seniors with i i know housing is going to be a a central item in that election um but we need to ensure that that the concerns of, of the seniors are are prominent there and and that will require folks making you know asking for that commitment you know to get my vote you need to tell me what you're going to do to support seniors and, and um that from there we'll get our mandate as a provincial crown corporation you know that's how government decides where to spend money is is what are the voters calling for what we're seeing within bc housing is that we want to we want the mandate to increase the existing supply of quality seniors appropriate affordable housing uh, housing that's accessible inclusive and addresses the specific needs of folks in the later stages of their life we'd also like to continue to uh, fund and, and expand the funding we're doing of of these aging in place programs whether it's hallway house or, or gaia community cares or others in in other communities um, to, to bring those services and supports for seniors into their homes. You know, we can, we can uh, get the, the mandate to build more homes for seniors, build more senior specific housing. But what we'd also love to be able to do is to be able to ensure that the supports are being brought into them uh, so that they can be living in that housing longer. Uh, you know, I, we're hearing uh, anytime we see polls on this sort of thing that the vast majority of folks want to age in place, want to stay in their home. Um, I think we've seen on the stress indicators throughout our lives that that moving is one of the biggest uh, life stresses and doing that at the later point of one's life when maybe they're, they've been living somewhere for such a long time and then being uprooted and having to change where they live because the service they need aren't available there has got to be uh, really, really tough. And, and so if we can cushion that by, by stretching out the time someone can stay, uh, we want to be able to do that. To be able to do it and do it well, and I think some, uh, 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 Christine and, and Michael and Tom have all spoken to how, you know, doing it with, with others, you know, in partnership, whether that's us funding other agencies to do work or, or other provincial agencies coming together, bringing health into housing and, and, and mental health and addictions into housing. You know, we're doing that for other segments of the population. I think we need to do that around supporting the seniors as well. 
Yeah, that's some great points there. And I love what you're saying. Yes, we need to build new, appropriate, affordable, supportive housing. However, it is much harder to rehouse someone once they've lost their housing. So keeping them yep. in the housing they're yeah. in, if they can age, I mean, it, it not only is it the best thing for the senior, but it's probably most economical as well, right? Building's really tough uh, and, and very expensive to do. Um, yeah. Let's talk about innovations. I, I often... Um, I was fortunate enough to go on a trip to the UK recently and we're more alike than we are different and we, we take pieces and say, you know what, why do we do that there? Uh, one of the things they had I thought was fantastic is that uh, when you're in the UK, if you see someone experiencing homelessness, there's an app you can have that you tap the location and the team goes to them, right? And they, and they give you feedback that, hey, we've gone, we've seen uh, Michael and, and he's going to be okay. Well, they wouldn't give information like that, but you know what I mean? Like, so you know, and, and it involves the community in saying, hey, listen, it's on all of us to, to help out. Because quite often people say, what can I do? You mentioned one of those things that I often answer is you have a vote. That's the most powerful thing you can use to make change happen, right? To give a mandate, as you said, to uh, to government. So uh, let's talk about um, innovations. And, uh, you know, at this time, uh, Jennifer, we're going to stick with you. And then we'll go to Christina and, and with Tom. Yeah, for sure. And that's fascinating, that app you mentioned in the UK. Uh, the UK is doing some really interesting stuff around housing. We often look to uh, what they're doing around social housing, for sure. Um, you know, here in Canada, you know, we, we still have a bit of a way to go to meet the needs of at-risk seniors. You know, our services and our supports, I, I believe, are at, at a, a high quality. But what we need is, is consistent funding and the opportunity to grow those services. So we look to places like, uh, and, and I feel like so often when we're talking about uh, things that we could do and could do better, we look to Scandinavia. You know, Denmark and Sweden, you know, what are they doing? Uh, well, they've committed significant resources and, and time and effort towards building really durable aging in place programs. They've also built up a really robust supply of affordable housing. Uh, both Denmark and Sweden focus on seniors staying in their homes. Uh, not as much of an emphasis as we have seen here in the past in Canada around care homes. And, and I don't know, I, I'm seeing a lot of people when you talk about care homes, long-term care, post COVID, that is just off the table for so many folks. They wanna stay in their homes. So emphasizing the programs that increase that capability, um, increase uh, balance, uh, strength. You know, we've seen far too many folks. It's that that one fall that uh, that sets them back and means that they have to move out of their home. So supporting folks, and and, and I've seen that in some of these programs like like Gaia and, and Hallway House, where they're doing those types of exercises with seniors around uh, balance. You know, it used to be that we talked a lot about ensuring that you kept up, you know, bone strength, and and that's really important, but. You know, I've seen that with with my dad also, you know, that if he can work to maintain his balance, then it's going to decrease the likelihood of, of a fall. So uh, seeing exercises and, and I would say that, you know, we look to our Scandinavian friends for the types of programs that they're doing in that respect. Um, there they're seeing reduced seniors hospital stays and real reductions in the costs to the public health care system as a result of these aging in place policies. So we're looking and, and, and this is again our folks in research who have, you know, looked at what's being done elsewhere and, and we're advising that this is the type of thing we want to invest in here in British Columbia. Yeah, very cool. And you're so right. And I remember one of the programs that sticks with me, I, I think it, it could have been Norway, it could have been Finland, but is where they combine the student housing and the yes. seniors housing. And the, se yeah. and the students got a discounted housing rate, but in return, there was some, what does Habitat call it? They call it, uh, um, oh, I, I don't know. It's basically, they're putting some volunteer hours with seniors. And I mean, there's all those. Sweat like, equity. Yeah, sweat equity. I hate yeah. that word, sweat equity. But um but it is putting in those hours and it's funny when you kind of you might feel that it's a little force at first but then the students are like wow i'm getting a ton out of this i love talking yeah. to these people with great life experience and the seniors are pulled out of isolation christina much like we talked about with that food program but yeah it's an innovative way of kind of i i like to say like when you have multiple wins um so you're, you're absolutely right we can look around the world and and see what we can pull over here. Christina, what are you seeing? Are you seeing some innovations that, that are happening either where you are or, or in Canada or outside that you would love to bring here? Yeah, one of the things that, that I think that is really important to 
to look at. And, and I was very fortunate to be part of a study tour to Denmark. So I had an opportunity to go and, and visit a number of, of the, um, the different housing types and communities and so forth. But one of the things that they share with us and um, you know, as much as they have the, the, I think the right direction for government policy and the way they approach aging in place and so forth is they are similarly challenged as are we in health human resource challenges, uh, shortages. And as the population ages, it's great to say, well, we'll just invest in all of these supports to keep people in their homes longer. But if we don't have the staff or the, the human resource staff to, to go in and provide the support, we need to look at other ways that we can, we can uh, support people perhaps through technology. And I've seen some really interesting technology around things like um, being able to predict somebody who is at, at risk of a fall, for example. Um, there's technology that will signal, for example, that um, an elderly person is, is starting to get out of bed at, at two o'clock in the morning, which is you know out of character for them. And that will send a signal to their care provider their family caregiver that says, maybe you should check out why mom is getting up at two o'clock in the morning. You know, maybe she has a UTI or, you know, there could be some health related thing or something else. So could be medication. So the technology actually is, is very sensitive to that kind of thing or a flooring that is, is wired to indicate that somebody has, has fallen. Um, so I think that we're going to need to look more and more to how we can implement technology to support and um, uh, reduce the need for that sort of human involvement uh, in providing that assisted care and enabling people to, to live in their homes. So, you know, we even uh, have technology, for example, that um, will turn off a stove if it's been left on too long because some somebody maybe has forgotten you know and left the pot on the stove and and is at risk so those are the kinds of things that that are available now uh some really cool stuff that's being developed but i think we from a, a policy perspective from an investment perspective we have to look at ways in which we can provide greater support to enable that technology to get into the homes of the people who are best going to be able to use it. And uh, right now that's not, you know, that's perhaps seen as kind of eh, a nice to do, but not sort of an important to do. And that was one of the messages that we got when we were in Denmark is that they're very much looking at investing. The, the government is investing in um, companies, tech companies, in um, uh, you know capstone projects and things like that, because they recognize that they have to do something to offset the fact that they, they just don't have enough people to care for the aging population in, in the way that we you know, currently are used to doing. Yeah, that's amazing. It's so important. I wouldn't have thought of that. You're so right. The technology and not only well, we don't have the, the, the people power, but also probably efficiency, right? And just cost effectiveness is, you know, that can help support as well. We could do more, yeah. uh, but it's got to be a priority for sure. Yeah. Uh, Tom, but, but, you know, I, just, I would just sort of caution. We don't want to replace the human no, touch. No. You know? So there is, <laughs> there is the balance because it's, it is important to, you know, for, for those issues of isolation, loneliness, social yeah. engagement, we, you know, we don't want to, you know, bring robots into everybody's house either, you know? So, um, but it's just how, how can we supplement care? in a way that we can use our, our very scarce health human resources in a better way. Love it, love it, yeah. Supplement, not replace, for sure. Uh, Tom, how about yourself, innovations? Yeah, so for, I guess in terms of innovation, I'm gonna take us to somewhere else besides uh, Northern Europe, and, and for me, it's Vienna in, in Austria, and what they, you know, I think, and I'm gonna take this, gonna elevate this to not specifically Toronto seniors, but from a larger kind of policy perspective. I mean, that is a city that has invested heavily in housing since like the 1920s and 75 percent of people who live in vienna choose to rent and so they have completely flipped the paradigm around home ownership 
you know, as as the penultimate dream to living, you know, renting is a very acceptable part. And also, I think it changes that paradigm around, you know, social and public housing as I'll use the term almost like a, a, a burden in society to a very kind of vibrant participating part of the community. And I think like, like for me, when we think about that, that that kind of innovation and change, there just needs to be a fundamental shift around around how how we view public and social social housing and how we contribute to that. And, and in Vienna as well, it's about high performance building, right? So as I, I mentioned earlier, it's not about what only is good for an improved living environment, but meeting those climate change targets and all those aspects of, of sustainability. So there are ways to innovate really at the at the organizational level, you know, but I, I'm really kind of passionately speaking to I think what we need to do from a societal perspective around how we how we view view social public housing, how we even collectively view home ownership, and it takes us to a place where it, it ensures as a I think as a, as a right to have a home, more people have a, a place to live. Wonderful, yeah, and you're absolutely right. Uh, so our final question before because. You'll, you'll get to talk once again about where people can go to find out more, but is really your hopes for the future. And Tom, I'm going to start with you, and then we'll go to Christina and Ed with Jennifer. What are your hopes for the future? Yeah, I think, you know, Michael, as you ask that question and reflecting on these questions, the, the, the first thing that, that comes to my mind, which is really the mandate for the, 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 the organization that I'm with, is that we want to provide the supports and, and services and, and housing so that people can a, you know, so that people can age in their home. I think that for me, if if how you know, in, in my time in this role can work with within uh, this organization, but also with our, our partners and and in the community about how we better coordinate that work, and and how we you know how we see that is a more continuous kind of delivery of, of support for right, from shelter into housing or to bringing in those supports or into long-term care into the health system you know it's just so so how that is just more more continual and, and more supportive and that's you know that's what the that that's what our, the, the seniors just so many of them want is that a, a more vibrant community to live and this and the supports to to age in, in their home and then also just i think from that kind of collective um you know um how from a broader broader community context just you know my my hope for for the for the future there is is that you know we we think more about and are, are more intentional around around different types of housing how we build that housing so that it is more sustainable more accessible uh uh for 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 our communities and for for individuals yeah, I love what you're saying there about different types of housing as well. My organization, Blue Door, one of our our men's emergency housing program, it's from age 18 to 99. Yeah. And let me tell you, I mean, very different needs for an 18-year-old yep. versus a, a senior. And so knowing that and doing nothing was not a choice. So we, we've we got a home now called uh, Forward for Senior Men. They come together. It's deeply affordable. And, and it's just a real social part, affordable, dignified. And I think we... You know, I keep thinking too is that there's this got to be a dignity piece there too, where if people are aging in place and and they've still got, you know, to, to retain that dignity that so many are not able to because they don't have the supports, right? Um, and so that that was big for us in, in designing that. And I hear what you're saying around yeah. the different types of uh, housing for sure. Uh, Christina, yourself, what hopes for the future? Well, I have to say, Tom ticked off a lot of my boxes <laughs> there and uh, definitely um, agree with, with much of what he said. I think the, the point about dignity, but also adding choice for, for older adults to be able to, to age in their own communities um, as long as possible, I think is, is sort of the vision and hope for the future. And to move away from this... Uh, this penchant that we seem to have to want to institutionalize older adults. You know, I think that there, there is, there is a place and a need for long-term care, but we shouldn't be seeing it or approaching it as affordable housing. It's not, it's housing that uh, supports very complex uh, care needs, 
but many people with those same complex care needs can still be cared for in their own homes with the, with the right supports. So I think we need to shift the way that we look at, at aging. Um, you know, there's a, a huge element of ageism in this sort of institutionalization model that, that we've, um, we continue to adopt, that governments continue to, uh, most governments continue to uh, put a lot of money into and look more at, at how can we truly support people to live their best lives in their own homes and in their own communities. I love that. And it made me think of uh, recently that the government received some pushback because in their housing starts or they were including housing, they were using student housing and long, uh, long-term housing, right, uh, as well. And you're saying that, sh- you know, that should not be kind of our aim. And not to put words in your mouth, but I hear I love choice. People should have choice uh, and, and, and choices in when you're given one choice. Thank you for that, Christina. Jennifer, uh, hopes? Yeah, um, you know, picking up on what I talked about earlier about uh, folks making making funding for, for seniors, uh, housing and seniors aging in place policies, making that a priority for government such that government prioritizes funding those programs. Um, I just want to pick up, you know, we've, we've all mentioned long-term care. And as, as I said myself, you know, it's become something that after the, after the pandemic, folks are saying, I don't want to go into long-term care. Um, and I think in some ways we've, there's, because, there's developed a little bit of a stigma, like uh, you don't want to go to long-term care. Oh my gosh, do everything you can to avoid that. There are some folks for whom long-term care is the right thing. There are some folks for whom long-term care is the only thing. And we need to make sure that it's appropriate and that it's fully funded and, and people can get the services they need and they aren't isolated should they need or choose to live in long-term care. Uh, and then I just want to bring up uh, something that has been a, a hope and dream for me for a long time, ever since my first nonprofit leadership gig at uh, Community, and that's thinking about uh, queer seniors and how for so many of us mm-hmm. who have lived, and I'm speaking you know, personally, lived uh, out loud and proud lives, all our adult lives, uh, the, the thought of going into a setting where I didn't feel free to be wholly me is terrifying. It's as terrifying as, as isolation or physical dependency. Mm-hmm. So uh, we we haven't seen yet that made a priority. How do we ensure that that our queer community as we age don't get forced back into the closet for the comfort of the other people who live where we live or for the comfort of the staff who are supporting us? And uh, you know, I think some of that is going to be uh, those of us in the queer community ourselves innovating ourselves and coming up with our own housing options so that we can live uh, older proud lives uh, so that was just my last little curveball i want to throw in there no it's brilliant you know what hey, jennifer what made me think of this so we in uh york region uh, we had two research studies not one that uh from the 2s lgbtq plus community for youth that showed us they didn't feel safe and the options weren't the options yeah. that were there, uh, they didn't like or were appropriate, right? And it took us two studies to finally say, okay, maybe we should do something. But then I think about it, why are we not thinking about that on the other end of the spectrum for seniors as well? Mm-hmm. So we did. We, we have a house called Inclusion, I-N-N, Inclusion. Uh, and it's been wonderful. And the youth are like, love it, feel safe. I'm connected. I'm in my community. It is beautiful, right? Like, it, I'm not. Uh, and, and so you're inspiring me to think about you know why would we not open a home like that for four or five seniors who say yeah i would love to do that um so yeah thank you so much for uh, for bringing that forward now you're all doing great work we've discussed the importance of partnerships on this podcast uh and the community if people want to learn more uh if they want to get involved if they want to partner they want to reach out to you uh, how can they do that uh christina we'll start with you then we'll go to tom and end with jennifer well, I would invite people to um, our website, www.chats.on.ca, and uh, all the information about our organization and ways to get involved. We rely very heavily on volunteers, as uh, most not-for-profit organizations do, and our volunteers really are the heart and soul of, of uh, how we are able to get out into the community and serve so many. So there's opportunities uh, there as well as information about our our programs and services. And as I said earlier, we have a podcast that uh, is available on Apple. I don't know all the other stuff, but (laughs) but, um, 
it's still new to me. Um, so hopefully we'll be able to get more awareness out there, more discussion about all of the issues that were raised today. And I thank all of the, um, the panelists. You've just been wonderful. You've inspired me as well. Thanks for that, Christina. And it's anywhere you, all I do is I say anywhere you can find podcasts, your podcast will be there. Uh, we'll be able to find it. So thank you and congrats on that. Uh, Tom, if people want yep. to find out about Toronto yeah, yeah. Uh, Seniors Housing. Yeah, similar, similar to Christina, the uh, website, uh, www.torontoseniorshousing.ca. Uh, and we're also available on the, uh, the social media platforms, uh, YouTube, LinkedIn, X, Facebook. So those are, those are spaces. Very cool. And last but not least, Jennifer. Yeah, um, BC Housing can be found online at bchousing.org. We're also across all of the social media platforms. And our uh, Vice President of Equity and Corporate Affairs, Sarah Goldvine, hosts a, a great podcast herself called Let's Talk Housing. And uh, I think maybe she's connected with you in the past, Michael. I'm, I, she has. She's been on yeah. the podcast. We've done a co-podcast. She's fantastic. Yeah, I so, seem to uh, be the one out on the podcast. Maybe I. <laughs> <laughs> you got to start one, Tom. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Says he who doesn't listen to podcasts. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's funny. My, my kids listen to a lot of podcasts. Some they do not listen to this one. This is very sector specific. <laughs> um, we're very fortunate to have all three of you. You're doing brilliant work, important work, life-changing work. And I encourage uh, our listeners, listen, be part of the solution. If you want to find out more, go to the mentioned websites, listen to the podcasts uh, from coast to coast. Incredible work. Uh, and thank you for the inspiration to do more. Uh, I know you are very, very busy people. So thank you for giving the time today. And thanks for all you're doing to make sure that uh, everyone can uh, live uh, live wonderful long productive safe and affordable lives great thank, thank you, you. Thank, thank you thanks so, so much michael thank you michael thanks everybody thank you great to meet you all nice yep. to meet you jennifer same bye-bye